If we've learned anything since October 7th, it's that ideas have consequences in the real world. I often joke, when your only tools are a hammer and a sickle, everything looks like a proletarian revolution to throw off the oppressor. On this episode of Liberty Curious, I was joined by Philip Magnus, Senior Research Faculty at AIR and F.A. Hayek Chair in Economics and Economic History, to discuss the rise of critical race theory in academia and the mainstream and how this relates to the far left's response to the brutal massacres of Israeli citizens by Hamas. Part of it is the narrative. It's the worldview that critical theory um, inculcates. If everything is framed as a power relationship of oppressor versus the oppressed, whether you do this on racial lines, gender, religion, ethnicity, colonies, you name it. Uh, if everything's framed that way, well, there's only one tool available to change the power relationship. We also discuss what the intersectional point is between critical race theory and decolonization. George Floyd was killed. As a result of a racist ideology held by some people, the same type of racism that killed George Floyd is being used against the Palestinians. If you enjoy this podcast, make sure to check it out on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts, and let us know what you think in the comments below. Unfortunately, the CRT literature is often very vague and fluid, but what it basically comes down to is critical theory is a branch of the academy, it's a school of thought that basically views the world as divided into power relationships between the oppressor and the oppressed, the haves, the have-nots, uh, derives out of uh, early 20th century Marxist thought, although it's a branch to break away from the revolutionary Marxists of the Soviet Union and Vladimir Lenin. Uh, this comes mostly out of Western Europe. Uh, but the idea is that uh, uh, power relationships and a struggle between the haves and have-nots are the driving mechanism of history. Uh, so critical theory really kind of came into its own as its uh, a field of study in the 1930s. And then beginning in about the uh, late 1970s, early to mid-1980s, uh, there was a school of legal scholars, uh, mostly came out of uh, civil rights law, that took the concept of critical theory, this framework, and applied it specifically to race. Uh, so race becomes the unit of analysis, oppressor versus the oppressed becomes the mechanism that defines society. And uh, the purpose of critical race theory is to, it purports to understand and discover and disentangle uh, these different p power relationships that exist basically along racial lines uh, that are codified into law or that are applied in the way that uh, legal structures exist. Uh, so they, they claim to find discriminatory institutions and then they run with it from there. So this is really important to talk about right now because this is not just this abstract fringe academic idea. We see that ideas have consequences now. And I just want to read to you some of the examples of prominent CRT theory professors and proponents of CRT, their responses to this. Okay, so I'll give you, I'll give you three. And I'm sure that you have multiple more examples that you can dig up on your own. But let's talk about these three. So you have Amir Loggins, a CRT instructor at Stanford University, was fired after justifying Hamas's war crimes, trivializing the Holocaust, and making Jewish students stand in a corner so that they could feel what Palestinians have been feeling for decades. So that's the first one. Um, the second one comes from, this is from the post-millennial Gemma Di Cristo, a far-left trans assistant professor of American studies at UC Davis. And American studies, of course, means history viewed through this critical theory and CRT lens. He wrote, one group of people we have easy access to in the U.S. is all these Zionist journalists who spread propaganda and misinformation. They have houses with addresses, kids in school. They can fear their bosses, but they should fear us more. And he put these emojis, a knife, an ax, and drops of blood. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Did you yep, hear about that, that one? That, that tracks with uh, things that I have been seeing over the last couple of weeks as well. 
And uh, what, I think what it speaks to is this particular event has really kind of pulled off the covers and shown academia for uh, for what it is. It's political biases and it's, uh, it's adoption of some really radical and I dare say racist and bigoted rhetoric in the name of classifying things in this power relationship of oppressor versus oppressed. Uh, now they've pre-designated the Palestinians as oppressed. I'm not going to even get into the politics of Israel versus Palestine. It's a very mm-hmm. complex area. But they've pre-designated uh, Palestinians as oppressed, and this, in the critical theory worldview, becomes a license to rise up and basically do almost anything imaginable, unspeakable atrocities, uh, become justifiable in the name of throwing off the uh, designated colonial oppressors. And in this particular case, uh, you're dealing with a, uh, a a country that uh, its own history and existence comes out of uh, the legacy of the Holocaust and and some terrible events in the early 20th century uh, that that led, basically led to the creation of a Jewish state. So uh, what, one of the oddities here is they end up embracing anti-Semitism as a tool for supposedly throwing off what they have designated the oppressor. Uh, but it, again, it's back to this worldview of seeing themselves as inherently righteous seeing everyone else as inherently evil, uh, you know, once you've adopted that worldview, uh, you give yourself a license to do almost anything in the name of defeating the enemy, defeating the adversary. Uh, So this is a common theme that comes out of the critical theory uh, literature and scholarship as uh, you, you can basically rationalize anything up to and including bigotry, racism, uh, human rights violations, atrocities, uh, e- even genocide in the name of the supposed cause of emancipating the oppressed from the claimed oppressor. Well, I'm just going to read you my third example, which totally supports what you were just saying. And this is from the University of California, Santa Cruz, the Critical Race and Ethnic Studies Department. So they study race intersectionality in the context of power, as you just described. And they released a statement on October 11th. What we are witnessing needs to be understood in the context of 75 years of settler colonial displacement, military occupation, and enclosure. As in the past, racialized media coverage dehumanizes Palestinians, delegitimizing their aspirations for freedom and military and militarism, colonial rule, and incarceration. So are you surprised, Phil, to see this kind of reaction from proponents of CRT? Uh, not at all. I mean, this has been part of their rhetoric for decades, basically since the field came into its own. I think what's shocking about it is it's now on full public display, and this follows after uh, at least the last two to three years, uh, defenders of CRT have been trying to pass it off as this igno- innocuous, uh, obscure legal theory that just informs civil rights law and is relatively benign, only considered by uh, uh, experts at the top end of the academy, uh, where Whereas what we're actually seeing is it's uh, it has strong ideological commitments that are very, very far to the left, and they're visibly expressing themselves in ways that I think most Americans are seeing, and they're horrified by this. Uh, these are outright defenses of acts of murder, kidnapping, and terrorism. Uh, and, and, you know, I can say that regardless of whether uh, I sympathize with, with different aspects of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Again, that's a, a, a very complex geopolitical issue. But uh, to try to reduce what is clearly a terrorist act by radical, theocratically inclined uh, uh, figures that have a history of, of engaging in violence, and not just violence, but violence against civilian populations. They didn't go in and target the Israeli military. They attacked a concert. They attacked uh, uh, villages. So they, they, they shot children, basically. Uh, this type of violence, I think we can, most people in, in, in common and decent society can agree, is wrong. And yet here we're seeing this justified by academics in the name of this political upheaval, this emancipatory uh, overthrowing the oppressor versus the oppressed framework that uh, critical theory has inculcated. And, you know, this is normal academic discourse for this branch of the academy, yet it's very uh, uh, very much at odds with the, with the general public. So we have a real mismatch right now between some of the ideological priors of the ac- academic world, uh, which has just wrapped itself in this stuff, moved far to the left, 
left of the last several decades uh, versus the general public that's watching it and recoiling in horror. And that's why I think people are just kind of shocked to see how the Academy has reacted to this. So you have multiple examples now. Multi-million dollar donors and alumni are pulling their uh, their endowments and donations away from top universities. Uh, mm -hmm. There are examples of, uh, of scholars and uh, academics and, and even policymakers that are canceling their affiliations with Harvard and Princeton and Yale and Penn. Uh, so these are major top universities that are considered prestigious, and it turns out they're just hotbeds of really kooky, far left-wing activism uh, propagated by the critical theory world. I'm sure that you've also seen this uh, viral tweet that's been going around uh, and somebody wrote, just an ordinary uh, Twitter X user wrote, what did y'all think decolonization meant? Vibes, papers, essays, losers. Yeah. So do you think then, you were just saying you don't think that this is um, a widely shared sentiment among people beyond the kind of CRT, social justice crowd, like you... Do you think that this is just a fringe view or do you think that there's also part of the the ordinary population who are kind of being pulled into this, even with the way that it's being um, covered by the yeah. mainstream media? It's kind of like the talking points that I've seen are, of course, we stand with Israel and it's really terrible what happened. But there seems to be a lot more emphasis put on um, the retaliatory moves and people are yeah. seeming to have kind of glossed over October 7th's atrocities and really focus on uh, the same kind of uh, oppressor and oppressed dynamic that we see in CRT. Yeah, it, you know, it's filtered into journalism. Uh, and this has been true for probably the last decade, if not more. Uh, and this is why we're seeing a lot of the coverage of the, the Israel-Gaza war that's, that's broken out. Uh, Places like the New York Times have been caught multiple times now by putting up headlines that turn out to be false uh, or turn out to be parroting misinformation uh, that was put out, including put out by the terrorists. Uh, so they had to pull down uh, a headline a couple uh, days ago about uh, the uh, one of the misfired rockets that hit a hospital. And it turns out after investigation, they think the best intelligence sources are now saying that this is probably a Palestinian rocket that broke up in the air and then landed on the hospital. So it's a horrific, tragic event. But the New York Times ran a headline uh, basically claiming that it was uh, uh, Israeli targeting of, uh, of civilians. And in this irresponsible act of journalism, uh, it inflamed uh, protests around the world. It, it, it got all sorts of uh, uh, just really crazy rhetoric uh, going on. So it's a, extremely irresponsible acts of journalism that I think are facilitated because journalists, especially in the legacy uh, elite media, have become acclimated to this critical theory worldview, and that comes almost entirely out of academia. Right. So we're going to get into a little bit later the research that you've done on this and what you found in um, the kind of rise to prominence of CRT and these kind of other critical theory offshoots. Um, but first, I wanted to read something that you wrote in your recent uh, piece on AIER, where you said one of the CRT scholars, Richard Delgado, had said, we didn't set out to colonize. And he's talking about right. CRT. We didn't set out to colonize, but found a natural affinity in education. Seeing critical race theory take off in education has been a source of great satisfaction for the two of us. Critical race theory is in some ways livelier in education right now than it is in the law. So my question there is, what were his comments specifically about? And a bigger picture question that I have for you is, who is colonizing who? Right, right. So this is uh, Richard Delgado is one of the he's seen as one of the co-founders of critical race theory as a discipline. Uh, does some of the formative work in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and he's a legal theorist. He's a law professor, very much on the far left. Uh, him and uh, Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, and a few others are are the major participants in these early seminars. And that quote comes from an article uh, 
uh, written in, I think it was around 2010, 2011, where he's doing a retrospective on how critical race theory had taken off in law schools. And the interviewer asked him, well, what's the course this was charted out? And he says, yes, when we started out, we were a very obscure, little niche uh, academic discipline. Uh, basically just a, a dozen or so people coming to the same conference, all with the same political persuasion. Uh, but what he's basically saying is two decades or so after the founding, uh, CRT had expanded beyond law school and spilled over into sociology, into philosophy, into all these humanities departments, and in particular, schools of education, schools that train teachers through, for K-12 through instruction. Uh, it's where teachers go to get master's degrees, and some of them even get uh, doctorates in education uh, to, to specialize in uh, and basically pedagogical techniques for children. Uh, and he's saying that, that the education schools have been the one place where CRT has really taken hold. Uh, now, whether it's, uh, it's colonization in the sense, I don't think Richard Delgado and Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw hatched a plan to move this into uh, education schools. But what you see is education schools themselves had undergone an infusion of critical theory uh, from a, a, a parallel route, like a close cousin route. Um, this is Paulo Freire, who uh, uh, was a Brazilian Marxist education theorist in the late 1960s and early 70s. Uh, he wrote uh, a couple of formative texts in something that we call critical pedagogy. And just like CRT is critical theory applied to race, critical pedagogy is critical theory applied to classroom instruction. So there was a natural affinity that existed there. And what you see is a lot of the pr uh, critical pedagogy uh, who had taken root in education schools naturally just grabbed onto CRT and brought it straight into the curriculum. Does this mean they're teaching K through 12 teachers uh, abstract theories of critical race theory? No, but it does mean that they're teaching them political perspectives and the general framework of oppressor versus oppressed, and the idea that race needs to be like shoehorned into everything. And the idea that uh, capitalism, so this is a major tenet of critical race theory, uh, even though it, it operates on the premise that it's, it's dealing with uh, uh, civil rights issues and civil rights laws, what they're really uh, doing on that and what they're really arguing is that capitalism itself is the source of the unjust allocation of both material goods and power relationships. Uh, the oppressor versus the oppressed is just like a Marxian framework in that sense. So critical race theory adopts a stance that free market capitalism is inherently racist and needs to be overturned, and that gets infused into these pedagogical traditions that emerge from it. So is there also um, a kind of academic meaning to what we've been hearing uh, about decolonization? Where Does that come from the critical theory school? Absolutely. Critical theory and its close cousins. Uh, one of the major figures there is a, uh, a, a writer in the 1950s, uh, mid-century, uh, Marxist theorist by the name of Franz Fanon. And he wrote a uh, uh, basically a, a book and a series of pamphlets uh, that are considered the formative literature of decolonization movements. Uh, and, mm. and the notion here is that former colonies of mainly the European powers um, are engaged in a revolutionary struggle to throw off their chains, throw off their oppressors. And, uh, of course, this exists at the mid-20th century. It's a time when the Soviet Union is all too eager to foment these types of revolutions in the former colonies, uh, mostly in Africa, some in the Caribbean, a little bit in South mm. America as uh, as uh, both independence movements are taking off in the wake of World War II, um, and European powers are giving up their colonies. Uh, basically, what you get are uh, fomenting of revolutionary uh, movements in several of these countries under the name of casting off, throwing off the oppressor, uh, of decolonizing. And then the Soviet Union is all too eager there to give them a Marxist alternative there. Although, weirdly, even the Soviet Union is is probably the most aggressive imperial power in the world in the mid to, to late 20th century. Uh, the Soviet Union itself never gets considered a colonizer or an imperialist. Uh, so it's a, it's a really weird way of looking at the world because uh, Fanon and, and his many followers uh, in that particular branch of the literature are perfectly okay with Marxian socialism uh, because it claims to be acting on behalf of the oppressed and it claims to be fighting the oppressor, which is evil Western capitalism in their worldview. So this is just um, kind of 
an extension of that, and and we've seen it kind of coming to roost now. So I read somewhere that I think it's 50% of Americans under 25 actively support what they are perceiving as Hamas leading the Palestinian people into liberation, breaking their chains from their oppressors. That's really the way that they see that. So, you know, how does this whole thing just illustrate the darkness and the dangers of CRT, social justice, other offshoots of critical theory in the real world. You know, I often joke, when your only tools are a hammer and a sickle, everything looks like a proletarian revolution to throw off the oppressor. And part of it is the narrative. It's the worldview that critical theory um, inculcates. If everything is framed as a power relationship of oppressor versus the oppressed, whether you do this on racial lines, gender, religion, ethnicity, colonies, you name it. Uh, if everything's framed that way, well, there's only one tool available uh, to change the power relationship, and that uh, that is a tool that uh, is very conducive to burning things down, to uh, engaging in revolutionary action, and engaging even in atrocity in the name of, of emancipatory justice, uh, of engaging in theft, property destruction, and then ultimately, in the most extreme cases, destruction of human life. So, okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, the research that you, you've done recently on this, which is the proliferation of CRT in academia. Right. Um, when did this come to be? And can you give a little bit of background on, on why you wanted to do this research in the yeah. first place? Yeah, so, so I've been studying uh, ideological movements in the academy, particularly among faculty, for, for many, many years. And, you know, the, the most conventional version of that is looking at the left-to-right distribution of where faculty personally affiliate. And we've been tracking that basically since the 1960s. There's been a literature on it that dates even a, a couple decades before that. Uh, but uh, there's always been an interest to see if the academy represents the political viewpoints, and I mean the spread of political viewpoints, of society in general. Uh, this is a public interest question because... Academia is heavily subsidized by the taxpayers. And if we're throwing billions of dollars every year into this public entity, and yet it only represents one single narrow viewpoint, there's a problem. If, on the other hand, it represents a diversity of viewpoints, an argument could be made that academia is serving the general public. Uh, so I, I've been studying this for years, uh, and one of the, the one of the major findings of it is, is in the last two decades, basically since about 2000 to the present, academia has shifted sharply leftward, like aggressively leftward. Uh, The political left used to be a plurality, but there were also moderate and conservative minorities. Libertarians fit somewhere in that. Uh, uh, It's just the way the the, the opinion surveys are asked, but uh, uh, the uh, progressives were a plurality, and there's minorities of other factions, but they're stable and vibrant and robust minorities. Since about 2000 to the present, uh, left-leaning progressives have skyrocketed in number. Now they're about 60% of all faculty and 80 to 90% in many humanities and social sciences. And as they've done so, the other two components, moderates and conservatives, have dwindled away, and including conservatives, are almost nothing. Most recent survey data shows it's, it's only about 10% of the academy identifies anywhere at all on the right. Uh, which is an oh. extreme mismatch from the American public when you have a, a, a country that's split about evenly between left and right, but the academy is is overwhelmingly on the left and almost nobody on the right. That seems to be uh, uh, an entity that's taxpayer-funded that's only servicing one side of society. So I've been studying this for years and trying to find ways to measure it and interpret it uh, and analyze it and figure out what's going on here. Uh, so CRT enters into the fray because one of the driving mechanisms of this leftward shift uh, has been a uh, an intrusion of this critical theory mindset. It's kind of displaced what I call old school ACLU style left liberalism. Uh, and this is left liberalism from the mid 20th century. They were generally on the economic left. They were Keynesians. They favored greater government intervention. They supported the New Deal, but they also adhered to certain liberal values like freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and toleration for dissenting viewpoints. And basically, what I argue is that that was probably the dominant viewpoint of the left wing plurality in the academy from about the mid 20th century till around the 1990s. Uh, and as uh, 
those generations of academics have retired, they've been replaced more so by critical theory scholars, which are part of the, the leftward push. And the critical theory outlook says, uh, no, we don't really have so much uh, room for alternative viewpoints, especially viewpoints that we consider noxious, and they consider everything that's associated with free markets and uh, liberal capitalism, or they denounce it as neoliberalism is another slur they use. They consider that mm. all, all noxious. Uh, now that's the enemy to be driven out of the academy. Uh, so so these, these trends are, are certainly afoot. And then I started looking at critical race theory as one of the uh, the foremost and best known of these examples. And, uh, you know, many, many of your listeners will probably remember it was in, uh, I think, late t- 2020, Fox News and Tucker Carlson tonight did a, a special on critical race theory. And this is after the George Floyd protests. This is after all of the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement burst into the scene uh, over that summer. Uh, so they're using this as an interpretive framework. And, yeah, uh, Tucker Carlson's a polemicist, uh, but he nonetheless identified that critical race theory was kind of an academic underpinning. And when he did that, you start getting all the responses from defenders on the left, MSNBC's Joy Reid, uh, mm. pra- practically, uh, so she, she's just one example, but you could go through the New York Times, the Atlantic, uh, Politico, uh, uh, all, all these major uh, media outlets, they all do features on critical race theory, uh, but the way they treat the story is not why is critical race theory informed and influenced all these movements and events that have happened over the summer, uh, that they basically offer kind of like a conspiracy theory and claim that Tucker Carlson, through his television show, elevated a very obscure branch of academic philosophy and made it the boogeyman to blame all of society's problems on. And I'm watching this and like, wait a minute, I've been studying this for years. Critical race theory didn't just emerge out of a vacuum, and it was not an obscure academic theory prior to Tucker Carlson. In fact, it had been growing as one of the dominant threads of academic discourse for the better part of a decade before that. So I decided I was going to go map it out and look for empirical indicators to see if you can track the emergence of critical race theory from a very small peripheral Marxist school that emerges in the late 80s, early 90s, literally a legal seminar of about a dozen people, uh, to becoming one of the most influential movements that spreads across not only law schools, but education schools, humanities, social sciences, and then the, the academy broadly. So basically, they were trying to claim they had this kind of moral panic, claiming, mm-hmm. you know, this is just the the right wing are pointing this out now, and that's not what's really happening. But indeed, uh, this was something that was existing already that was starting to rise. Um, and I guess my question for you, Phil, because you've studied, you know, you've gone so far into history, you know, you've done the American Revolution, you've done slavery, you've looked at large collectivist mass movements, um, such as, you know, the uh, the USSR is one great example and, and other things. So, you know, going into the wheelhouse of things that you know, um, what's your opinion on what makes this kind of um, persuasion so seductive for people? Yeah. Why do the youth really ascribe to these kinds of ideas of the oppressed and the oppressor? Well, it's a very neat and tidy framework of looking at a complex world. If you can divide everyone into oppressed versus oppressor, good versus bad, uh, you know, it's easy to associate yourself with the righteous side, claim to be on the good side. And then once you've done that, everyone else is on the wrong side, the bad side. Uh, You know, that's a dichotomy for looking at the world that sorts things that are otherwise very nuanced and complex into two easy buckets. So, so that's certainly appealing in the way that this rhetoric is offered. And it's the same thing that uh, why the rhetoric behind socialism and communism always had attract a following eventually, at least on uh, among uh, uh, people that are not giving too much attention to them but are listening to the promises. Because not only does this uh, frame work, uh, divide the world into good versus evil, it also promises outcomes that advance the, the claimed good. It promises, if you only listen to us and adopt our theory, then people who have been oppressed and exploited and wronged in the world will have everything righted for them, and they'll uh, they'll get what is owed to them. Uh, they'll, uh, you know, the old Soviet uh, and, uh, and Marxist iterations of this is uh, the workers will attain the fruits of their labor that's been denied to them by the uh, uh, the bourgeois. Uh, 
uh, CRT is a similar type of thing. It's like, it, it, you know, if you only follow this framework, those that have been racially oppressed, and, it, you know, I'm absolutely acknowledging, yes, there are horrendous instances of racial oppression and segregation and awful things that were done in the past, awful things that continue to be done today uh, for racist motives, but they're basically giving a very simplistic diagnosis of that and saying, if you follow us, we'll lead you to emancipation, we'll lead you to uprise and overturn these unjust uh, components of society. You can get your reparations, you can get your payment, uh, and everything will be righted by the world. Uh, now, these promises are offered as an ideal. Uh, the reality in practice is most of these ideologies descend very rapidly into uh, totalitarian tools and mechanisms, into uh, petty tyrannies of, uh, of just government, raw government force whenever they achieve power. You know, that's the history of 20th century communism is every movement that came along and said, well, we're going to do it right this time within uh, a couple of years, if not months, has descended into a genocidal dictatorship that is enforcing what it claims to be right at the point of a gun or a bayonet. So, you know, even communism, even the Soviet Union, even Leninist Marx Marxism had these kind of promises, which were based on, you know, the redistribution of fruits and things like that. Yeah, yeah. But right now, you know, dealing with a completely different worldview, like which is not a humanistic worldview, because I've I've read this recently as 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 bizarre as it may seem, and I've read this from a couple of people, um, including Rene Girard. Yeah. Uh, even communism was humanistic in a sense. You know, it had these ideals of like we're going to redistribute everything equally among everybody, and everybody will be equal. But here. You know, coming from the far left now and also coming from um, Hamas or those kinds of regimes, which which are very different than Western regimes. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say that they're humanistic regimes. Um, what are the promises being made for decolonization? Are there is there anything but destruction and nihilism? Well, and that's some of the bizarre features you've seen uh, appear on Twitter from some of these these critical theory academics in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, you know, one thing to think of it: you look at regimes like Iran, uh, some of the ideologies that uh, exist behind Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, regardless of the power relationship, the oppressor versus oppressed dichotomy that the uh, critical theory world uh, grasps onto. Many of the people in these actual movements are basically religious theocrats. Uh, they're people that have extremely illiberal views of the world, uh, would engage in, in some very horrendous uh, oppression if they ever attained more power than they already do. And in, in fact, we see that in Iran right now. Uh, it's a theocratic society. Uh, it's very illiberal. Uh, freedom of, of, of speech, freedom of worship, freedom of assembly are uh, are very heavily suppressed there. Uh, gender equality is non-existent. Uh, these are extremely illiberal regimes, uh, but nonetheless, they're also claiming to be historical victims of oppression. Well, what does this do when you, again, you're back in the critical theory framework when everything is only oppressor versus oppressed? Um, if the critical theory world has identified some of these regimes as the oppressed and therefore sympathized with them. It subordinated its own other professed uh, concerns about what we call liberal values to uh, propping up what ends up being basically a very, very illiberal society. And they seem to be okay with that. Right. It's, it's, it's been very mind-blowing uh, to watch this all play out. Uh, and to watch the reaction from the far left, from academic institutions, from student groups, um, from CRT professors and the like. But do you think that there's any silver lining uh, to all of this being exposed? Like, for example, yeah. I thought it's going to be the end of woke, but that's not what's happened. But are there yeah. silver linings? <laughs> well, the silver lining I think we already see is afoot. Uh, donors are revolting against academia. 
uh, major funders that had basically just written a check every year to their alma mater because they thought it was advancing scientific knowledge, advancing a, a, a well-educated society, advancing the football team, whatever motive they gave to uh, for their donations. Now that's out the window because they see that these are basically just employment systems for radical left-wing activists, jobs programs for radical left-wing activists. Uh, I think you'll also start to see some of the, the scrutiny that's coming out of public budgets. Uh, the taxpayers are now awoken in their own way uh, to see what, what is happening on uh, uh, colleges' camp campuses. You know, they, they saw the Great Awakening, uh, which is something that I talk about in the article that you can measure from the uh, mid-2010s to the present, uh, the, this, this very sharp leftward drift. Well, taxpayers are now seeing that, and they're saying, we don't necessarily uh, want our tax dollars going to funding just crazy left activism. Uh, this isn't the purpose of higher education. This isn't why we bought into the university system and decided to publicly fund it in the first place. The reason most voters want to give funding to universities is because it advances scientific knowledge and it makes uh, education accessible to their children and grandchildren and it provides spillover effects to the public. When all universities are doing is far-left activism, that's not a spillover that most of the public wants to have. It's actually a negative spillover. Uh, it, it, uh, it starts to pollute uh, the discourse of other areas of society, and this is what we see of... Uh, Academia moving into journalism, moving into the corporate boardrooms uh, with some of these crazy fringe ideologies that uh, even a generation ago would have been looked at and, and just scoffed at. Well, now finally, with academia showing kind of its true colors, uh, it's the emperor had, has no clothes moment. It's uh, the prestigious institution of Harvard, Princeton, and Yale is no longer all that prestigious. It's just a jobs program for crazy left-wing activists. And the more the public realizes that, I think we have a chance of actually uh, uh, changing the course of the academy, riding the ship a bit. Okay, and uh, last question. Um, why is it important to change the course of the ship of the academy if we want to live in a, in a more liberal society or, or return to a more liberal society? Yeah. Well, I think the, the academic ideal is something that's worth fighting for. Uh, we, we want to have a scientific discussion. We want a discovery process that comes from deep, rigorous study of knowledge and, uh, and deep empirical analysis of looking at evidence. And this is something that the Academy at least used to put itself forward as being a home for. Uh, whether it always lived up to that ideal, I don't maintain any pretense that it did. Uh, academia has uh, many, many problems. I've written an entire book on that subject uh, that, that are separate and apart from the ideological ones. But at the same time, at least the concept there of, of being a curator of knowledge and a, uh, a a vehicle for uh, intense, expert-driven, uh, evidence-driven discussion uh, is something that society should want and should value. Uh, and the further that we've drifted away from that, I think we now have an academy that's doing very, very little to service those goals. Uh, the point here being that uh, you know, the more that we can show how far it's drifted, uh, maybe that's an opportunity to disrupt academia in a way that either gets us back to the ideal uh, or gets us uh, uh, new, innovative entrance into the academic and, and knowledge creation marketplace that, uh, that can service those things that the academy now, unfortunately, has left behind. Well, Phil, uh, I really appreciate you coming on. I know that this is a, a tough topic to talk about in some areas because everything is raw and people are feeling very, very emotional and very divided over all of this. So I really appreciate your insights here. And uh, I'll link your articles below. Your book, uh, Cracks in the Ivory Tower, is the one you were just referring to uh, on academia, I believe. And um, any last thoughts before you go? Uh, I think that more or less covers it. It's going to be very interesting to see uh, how this develops in the coming weeks and months, uh, particularly now that, uh, you know, as I, as I said, the public has noticed that there's something wrong in the academy. And uh, I think that's going to manifest in ways that the public uh, uh, starts to reclaim some of its tax dollars or starts to reconsider uh, the way that we have advanced academia with policies that, uh, that fund and subsidize and support it. Great. Thank you so much, Phil. All right. Thank you.